<laughs> all right. All right, can, um, again, I can start? Yeah, okay. please. All right, so I'm super excited to share some of the recent work um, my group has been working on in the last few years. And the title of today's talk is Theoretical Exploration of Foundation Models, and especially their adaptation methods. Um, the title is actually pretty carefully written, theoretical exploration. I don't think we still have any really strong theoretical framework or theory that can be used to explain every detail of foundation models. But I think it's time to start exploring what we can do and what, what we can bring into the table from the theoretical perspectives. All right, so um, feel free to interrupt any time. So foundation models is uh, something that people started calling big pre-trained model about three years ago. Um, this is the, the definition that I took from the first paper that coined this term. I would say the most important part here in the definition is the model should be adapted to a wide range of downstream tasks. What does it mean? So let's say if you have a language model, say GPT-4, or some llama, if you train on the large amount of data, you get some big model and you can adapt it to many different downstream tasks. So that's the key difference between the pre-trained model we used to play with, say 10 years ago, where you can still adapt to some downstream task, but it was more for specialized downstream task compared to the pre-training task. While here, um, the pre-training data is so diverse so basically, they assume that the foundation models has abilities to solve most of the problems once they are adapted carefully to the downstream task. So that's the kind of like a big difference in mindset. But let's see um, what we can do in terms of that adaptation. So the question um, I'm mostly working on these days is how we can do this adaptation more efficiently, and more effectively. So let's go back to um, 10 years ago, 2015, 14. We still worked on fine tuning. We still work with, uh, we, back in the days, we also worked with pre trained models. For instance, we used to take the, the image class CNN pre trained on ImageNet data set. We cut off the last few layers, we trained those last layers while creating the feature networks. That's what we already did back in 2014 15. Back in the days, um, there was a dilemma. Um, as a student, I was like trying to fine tune these models. And there are always, always two different choices. One, you fine tune the other layer. Two, you freeze some of the underlying layers, assuming that you already know the good features that are needed for solving this task, and only fine tune the last layer or last few layers. I don't think there was any good answer to these questions. Uh, it's always more like try your errors. You always report these two numbers. But if you carefully think about it, there are clear trade-offs between these two choices. If you use the first option, which is training all the layers, fine-tuning all the layers, in theory, you can learn new features because you're not living with the pre-trained features. However, that will require a large amount of data to train or, or also to learn new features. And also it requires more compute. On the other hand, if you fix the frozen feature extractor, then you don't need that many data anymore. You also save some compute at training time, but you won't be able to learn new features. So what should we do? Any, any, any idea here? Is, there, is this kind of fundamental trade-off or can we get around it? Well, um, so we've been stuck in this kind of mindset, I always choose this between these two operating regimes for a while, but people actually started doing something like this. So the, uh, by the way, I'm using this um, blue box for some frozen neural network layers or blocks where your model parameters are not trained. The orange boxes are for trainable boxes, trainable model parameters. So the idea here is this, it's a pretty simple idea. You have deep neural network, you freeze most of the networks, but every layer you unfreeze a little bit in terms of particular parameter parameterization and only train those parameters. If you look at this, it actually, um, if you can carefully design how to do this, you can learn new features because you're adapting the underlying features 
you're also adapting the model parameters in the lower layers. The overall num amount of num model parameters you are training is also still small. You probably need a smaller amount of data. Compute is still small because at training time, the memory cost is proportional to the amount of parameters you are training. And also small storage in terms of when you are storing the, the delta, say you have free train model, you only want to store the difference you obtained by fine tuning on downstream task, you only need to store this orange box. Mm -hmm. So in theory, it give you, gives you a good trade of um, kind of a good mix of these two different approaches we discussed before. And, and then this idea has started being studied for a while in the last four or five years, and people started calling it primary efficient planning. Yeah, we'll give you more details later, but that's the high level ideas. And people call this small model parameters that are adapted, they call it adapters. So the, the previous approach where with small data would have been just train the last layer or last few layers. So the idea behind that might be that, you know, there is a common representation mm -hmm. for a lot of different tasks. For example, suppose you want to predict yes. text from like, you know, JK Rowling mm -hmm. or, or maybe Shakespeare, but these are like all written in English. Mm -hmm. So you train something on all of English mm -hmm. and then find like, so, so there is the separation between learning representation and prediction. Right. right. And that's why, but now you are saying that we are going to do the whole stack, but it's a little from uh, exactly. So for some tasks, it's, it might be complex. I, I don't know, maybe we'll see in the performance, mm -hmm. but in languages, it seems like this other thing Mm -hmm. That's my one thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah. the question is, um, we'll talk about it soon, but do we really need to learn new features? Because maybe for, for large enough pre-trained models, maybe okay. the features that we already learned are good enough, so we don't need to even touch any of those lower layers. Um, so the short answer is, um, in practice, people observe that the one I showed here, tuning every layer little by little is still better than just tuning the last layers. So that probably means that either is, either the, the feature that you learned from pre-training is not good enough. Maybe it might be okay, but it's not good enough or not, not the optimal feature that you may wanna use for downstream tests, or maybe it's not just working at all. So not sure, um, but we'll talk about some theoretical justification of when that can happen soon. Thanks for the good question. Okay, so that's one approach that people started studying in the last five years. But then if you go even wider, why do we um, even fine tune the, the original network? Maybe all we need to do is just some kind of input transformation. So all, every layer, entire model parameters are fixed. And maybe all we need might be achievable by just transforming the input for a certain task. So people call it input reprogramming. That's the idea that came out from this famous paper from 2018. Um, but it's a special case of this can be viewed as prompt tuning. I'll explain what prompt tuning is later on, but in general, more generally, you should view this as input reprogramming. If you go even wilder, one step wilder, then maybe you don't need any changes to the or perturbations to the model parameters. Maybe the models we already have are good enough as a basic for achieving a basic functionality. Think about this as a, like um, GPT as a let's say register or some other model as a capacity. Like back in the days, I don't know how many of you are electric engineers, but I was. Um, uh, race as an electric engineer and all these like communication systems, circuit systems, all we learned was given this basic functionality component, how to design a system. So but now we have this really good pre-trained model or foundation model that actually are good at solving this basic function, so problems. So maybe it's time to design a system without fine-tuning anything. 
Now, well, you can think about the simplest approach, which is you have a one big model and you can self loop and see what happens. You may also want to make use of multiple featuring models or foundation models and come up with whatever your own um, system design. You can have some control statements, you can for loop, you may want to use multiple models at the same time. And there are a bunch of frameworks and even program language designed for writing a program on top of this foundation models. So these are the three um, completely new ways of adapting foundation models to downstream tasks. One, parameter efficient fine tuning. You tune each of the parameter little by little. Prompt tuning, you fix the entire network, only change the, um, the way input is being fed by making some transformation or system design. So I've been, uh, my lab has been working on both theory and algorithms in this domain. Um, so I quickly go through some of the recent work that I um, wanted to share. The first one is the um, the the one I'm going to talk about today is the extractive power analysis of LoRa. LoRa is one of the most popular and most successful parameter efficient fine tuning method. Uh, we talked about we studied how uh, we analyzed the extractive power of this method. The second part of this talk, I'm going to talk about the dual modes of in-context learning. So I'll explain what dual mode is. But in-context learning is another special case of prompt engineering, where you actually give some input-output pairs as part of the prompt, and you hope the model understands what task you want to solve. That's why you um, they call it in-context learning. And you can achieve, uh, you can make the model perform in context learning by providing labels and pairs as part of the prompt. In-context learning has very interesting um, two different types of modes. One is task learning, one is task retriever. I'm gonna explain what those things are. And the last two um, papers down there are about more about the system design. In this work, um, we showed the loop transformer is the universal computing machine. The fusion models, um, you can have many different ways to interpret the fusion models. One way to interpret the fusion model is image denoiser in a loop. And once you have that kind of um, interpretation, you can actually design a different way of analyzing these models as well as you can come up with new algorithms to train the visual models. So um, talking about algorithms, efficient fine tuning of language models, um, yeah, this is something I'm gonna talk about later. And I also work a lot on uh, designing systems with language models, alt model language models, diffusion models. So in fact, the last one I put it here is the, uh, we started uh, proposing the use of reinforcement learning algorithms for diffusion models, because once you see the diffusion model as a closed loop control system, and you can write down the control system formulation for diffusion model or image denoising, you can view the image denoising or let's say text to image generation. You can view that as whole condition control problem where the goal is to denoise image to the point that, uh, to the image that is consistent with the text description. So text to image generation can be viewed as goal condition control problem. And once you bring that insight, you can start applying the reinforcement learning algorithms as well. And that's what um, we developed in those work. In this two work, we use this um, language model as a base block, and we designed the system. This one we presented last year at ACL. The previous state-of-the-art chatbot before our work was something called BlendBot from Meta, where they trained a particular large language models on curated data set that is carefully designed for conversation chatbot. In this work, what we showed is if you just connect the existing pre-trained language models in a particular manner, without any fine tuning, you can achieve the state of the art. In this work, we did something very similar. We also connected language models in a particular manner to achieve the state of the art image clustering performance. And so um, I'm not going to talk about any of this. I focus on these two work, uh, but I'm happy to chat um, about the other work if you're interested in. All right, um, let me move on to the, uh, the first part. If you have any questions, you can...
Okay, so let me start with the, the first part. So the first part is going to be about the expressive power analysis of low rank adaptation or low rank sugar. Uh, this is a joint work with my student, Yu Chen Zeng. And LoRa is, again, this is a one particular way of doing parameter efficient fine tuning. I'm going to first give you a bunch of motivating examples of why LoRa became so popular and so powerful. I'll actually, start introducing what LNMs are. Everyone knows what LNMs are, but we'll give you a very quick introduction to that. We will explain what LNMs combined with LoRa can do. I'll also give you some examples of text to image models combined with LoRa can do to give you some good motivations. And then I'll move on to the, to the theory part where we formulate um, the LoRa as an optimization problem and how we can analyze the, the expressive power of LoRa. We'll give you a particular formulation and we'll show you some experimental research to, uh, to demonstrate what our theoretical findings bring into the table. All right, so LLMs, everyone knows what LLMs are by now. Um, LLMs are short for large language models. In, in short, it's just a next word predictor. Um, you have a finite vocabulary, and you just choose one of the um, best words that seems to be coming following the input sentence. So let's say um, the input sentence looks like this. In February, California is warm, and Wisconsin is <laughs> warm. warm. <laughs> That would be a bad language model. A good language model should predict cold 86%. That's what actually GPT-3.5 gave me in the morning. Um, you have also some other choices, very. So let me just pick very. Okay. I put in, um, append it to the input sentence. What will be the next word? Very warm. Cold is 98% now. Well, that makes sense, but I wasn't sure what this kuma was. Does anyone know what this kuma is for? <laughs> it makes me very kuma, very. Oh. <laughs> very, very. Yeah, I didn't continue, but uh, I know where it is heading. But but this is the, what the language model is doing. Basically, uh, every input sentence, you just give the probability distribution over the next word. And it's called generative model because you can keep feeding it back and generate one word by word. Let's go to something crazy. Um, I have an MNIST image data set, which is a 28 by 28 images. For each image, I convert it into a sequence of numbers, literally like a number, but written in strings, 0, 0, all this ASCII code, like 0, 0, and so on, like literally written in characters. And then the right arrow like this, and put the digit over it. What I did um, here is now, given this text corpus, I fine tuned GPT 3 on this data set using a primary efficient fine tuning method called LoRa. Anyone guess what will happen here? Okay, so let's say I uh, fine tuned this language model and have introduced this yellow orange adapter. Now it's fully fine tuned on this data set. So once you fine tune it, at testing time, what you can do is you take any MNIST test image, convert into a sequence of um, numbers, and stop it here. Okay, and see what this language model says. Because now it's gonna give me the distribution of the uh, probability distribution over the words, and you can see that um, it actually gives me the right um, digit. And in fact, you do this on the entire MNIST training data set. You train on the entire MNIST data set, testing on the, uh, on the MNIST test set. You get something like 98% actions. That's what we did at twenty twenty two. Um, back then, uh, we weren't actually not sure whether the model, um, the fine tuning we were doing was based on LoRa fine tuning because the way GPT fine tuning works is you submit your data set to OpenAI and OpenAI fine tunes it for you. And you only get access to the, um, the black box API. And they never tell you which efficient fine tuning method they are using. Later on, they um, revealed that they were actually using LoRa. Um, but back then we didn't know that. So in the paper, we didn't mention LoRa. But a year later, we published our paper, figured out 
that was actually low. That's pretty surprising, huh? You can just say that this is my data and this is my next. Like you can just give them input output and yeah. then they. Yeah, so uh, what we showed in this paper is, it's just one example with image classification, but we basically tried um, a lot of tabular classification sets, like by this data set, you get like 90% accuracy. And also there's something interesting with this tabular data set, because with this kind of approach, you can start providing the, the context that only exists in the, the column names or the feature names. Let's say iris, uh, you have an iris flower, the lens is three centimeter, but we never use the lens when we actually convert everything to numeric data and use logistic regression. But when you're using language models and fine tune it, you can actually say um, lens is three centimeter and so forth. You can also introduce the unit and the name of the columns and you show that using those units and using the proper names of the columns actually improves the performance. So there's some interesting things happening there. Um, uh, it was super expensive back then. GPT fine tuning was so expensive, so the overall paper actually costed more than fifteen k. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think it was worse. Um, hope I had llama before, but we didn't have llama back then. If you want to do even crazier, you can do the other way around. It's the same data set, but now I start from digit at the label first, and then the sequence of pixels. You fine tune it like that, and at testing time, what you can do is you just give zero an error. And you start um, speeding out some sequence of numbers, and then you can visualize it like this. Does that make sense? And you can actually generate, um, train a pretty reasonable image generator. I don't think it's as good as MNIST um, GANs or something like that, but it still works like this, which is pretty mind-blowing. So did you also have some accuracy value for this? Like for for generative for models, generative. not really. We only just like visualize so like, just, because it's not as good as even GANs. So we didn't even right. bother to measure any of the accuracies. Right. So how many parameters did you find you? Uh, good question. Um, they never actually told us um for GPT fine tuning. Yeah. Because um GPT there's not even like hyperparameter we can specify. Um, in this paper, we actually have two results. One is GPT-3 black box fine tuning, one with GPT-J, uh, which was the open source version of GPT-2. Uh, with that, we only use like 1%. So you didn't even know where they are fine tuned. They might have fine tuned only the final layers. They might have fine tuned only you know, this E, like uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a few from each of the layers. Yes. Or yes. they might have done from like, you didn't know, but now better you know that they- Exactly. That's why uh, back, back in the days when we were writing the paper, we couldn't put primary efficient in the title. I see. Because I wasn't sure that they were actually doing primary efficient fine tuning or just they might have full blown the... fine tuning. Who knows, right? Which was not um, that likely anyway, because full fine tuning was too expensive anyway. Right. You now, now do you have some estimate like how what percentage of the parameters they fine tuned, for example, for this task? They didn't reveal the exact um, number of um, parameters they actually fine tune, but they at least acknowledge that they are using LoRa. And what you can infer from their um, their announcement is. The LoRa paper, um, I'll talk about it later, is actually written by the Microsoft people. And like a month after the LoRa paper came out, they introduced this fine tuning uh, feature to the OpenAI systems. And if you look at the um, LoRa paper, they actually have experiments with GPT-3 fine tuning. And they actually um, swift the number of parameters and they see that like, with this rank, with this number of parameters, start performing pretty well. So you can see kind of infer some of the good hyperparameters we found in that paper, and you can assume that they were using them. I'm not sure how much changes that they made. But yeah, for open source models, you are using a very small number of parameters. Um, cool. You can also have um, more numerical experiments. So here, what I'm doing is instead of just fine tuning an image data set or some other data set, you can just consider consider this kind of simple function classes. And you draw a function and you sample the, um, the actual values and give the um, y values cor corresponding to them, 
fine tune it. And once you fine tune the model, you can actually call, make inference calls for very fine grained trees. And you can actually visualize the function the model memorized. And you can see that um, right now, it's sampling is pretty dense, but even if you reduce the sampling rate to like half of this, you can still see that the function is pretty well memorized. And the interpolation property is pretty good. This very closely related to um, this paper by um, Gargadal, um, what, where they actually focus on in-context settings. So we'll talk about it later too. Cool. I'll just give you one more example before we actually move on to the, um, the research. The text to image models is an image model where you provide text prompt, it gives you the image corresponding to the text. A serial diffusion is one of the most popular. So let's say um, I have a hard task. The hard task I have is I give some name of the, let's say, celebrity, mm -hmm. and I want the model to draw a funny portrait uh, like the one drawn by MS Paint. So that's my task. If you do um, use SDXL, SDXL is the, uh, the state of the art open source model, here with the Fusion X large, which has like 1 billion model parameters. She asked the model to draw MS Paint portrait of Keanu Reeves. That's what you get. You get something pretty good. You have very simple choice of colors. But once you fine tune LoRa on the previous data set I showed, you get something like this. So that's what actually I was looking for. And you can see that like um, even though even if I only train like order of 10 million parameters, the model completely changes its um, way of drawing everything. Um, so that's a really efficient way of adapting to the downstream task. And you cannot do this by just fine-tuning the last layers. There's a one example where last layer fine-tuning doesn't give you style has completely changed. Style has completely changed, yes. Even the even though what? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there are some randomness there, so that could be the case too, yep. All right, so uh, the question here is, what, okay, so LoRa um, is the most successful parameter efficient fine-tuning method out there. Is there any theoretical justification of what they're doing? That's number one question. Number two question is, can we bring some new ideas based on what um, we analyze and I would say um, right now what we have is we have some understanding of why LoRa works. Can we design better algorithms? That's an ongoing work. Um, but we'll actually uh, at least show some of the research we uh, have on LoRa. So LoRa is the, um, the idea that came from this paper from Hu et al. Um, it was actually originally developed and proposed for large language models. Some funny thing is um, nobody used it for fine tuning large language model because there was no open source large language models back then. Only OpenAI and Microsoft were using it. The first foundation, big foundation model that was open source, I would say, is stable diffusion models. So people started using LoRa for fine tuning stable diffusion models first. So the LoRa has been gained uh, has gained popularity within the text image models, and then later on Llama came up. And people started borrowing all these techniques to Lama fine Okay, cool. So what is LoRa? So you have a layer. Let's so say this is a transformer layers. Within transformer layer, there are multiple fully connected neural networks. And imagine like consider one particular fully connected neural network. Okay, but d dimensional input x is multiplied by d by d weight matrix gives you the d, d dimensional output. What they do is they actually reparameterize your network like this. So this is a frozen parameter, which is from the pre-trained model. And you introduce this kind of A times B product form, which is, you can visualize like this. So you have this like low rank constraint update by design. So by just introducing this kind of reparameterization, you fix this, you only compute the gradient with respect to these two guys and updated them. So you can actually control the, the maximum rank deviation from the pre-trained model parameter by just choosing the, the size of that matrix. Okay. And that's it. You just use the same gradient staff, gradient descent algorithms, nothing changes. And that's how do you, you do LoRa fine tuning. What is known in theory? Basically nothing. It, um, basically we, um, we actually studied um, the literature pretty hard. Nothing is known. Um, there's one paper that we found, um, which is the um, paper from 
Maladi et al. and also from Fanjik's group, they consider this lazy training regime where you have a really small training um, rate, uh, learning rate, and they show that Nora fine tuning is as expressive as very fine tuning in the corner regime. Um, but I guess that's a very special um, setting where um, not all of the findings can be easily transferred to the, the actual setting where you use larger training rate. So um, more practically, I think it's almost nothing is known except this um, one very good exception. Um, and so this is the um, one and one in first work, one and only work that I'm aware of. So that's why we decided to study the expressive power first because that's the easiest, easiest thing to do. Um, this is the problem setting because it's fine tuning. So uh, what we are doing is now we are using the problem formulation borrowed from this Angeliki Janos et al, um, Dimitri Shashank, their work on analyzing the expressive power of the, of the normalization layer tuning paper. It's a really good paper. Um, and the idea we are borrowing is this. We assume the target neural network. You assume that this is the particular target neural network you want to emulate. And you start with this pre-trained network with different other parameters. And within certain constraint, the constraint I'm considering here is this low rank perturbation. So you start from this network, F not. F is W is changed to W plus delta W, but that delta W is low rank. So just to understand the architecture, mm -hmm. uh, what it means. So are, you are actually adding some like so you have a dense neural, like yes. suppose some there, and you are adding some more mm -hmm. edges. Mm -hmm. But instead of order of d square edges that were there, connecting the like two, right? So you have something like d times r, order of d times r. Well, it's edges. still. Um, it's still um, D it's, by D if you expand it, right? D but it's, it's low rank. You're just dividing as if it's like a. Yes. Um, okay, so these are like just extra features that you are, sorry, extra parameters that you are adding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But once you fine tune, once you find this, you can combine these two parameters. You can just add it. You can add them um, together. So there's no difference in inference. That, that, that makes course. Yes, yes. So, but during training time, yes. During training time, yes, yeah. you have the main and the separable. Okay. Um, so that's the setting. Um, <laughs> what is going on in the middle? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's true. <laughs> okay, maybe I can. Um, so let me see. Okay. I see. Yeah, like there was some kind of like water break, but <laughs> cool. All right. So um now um I'm gonna call this low rank adapters because it's an adapter that adapts the pre-trained model parameters to the downstream task. So the question, um, how closely can we approximate this target function using this fine tree? And I'll give you the simplest research and you can take a look at the paper for more general research, which is a deep linear model. The deep linear model is target network has like one linear network like this. But your pre-trained network is a deep linear network. There are L layers with WL being the parameter for each layer. Fine tuned neural network will be like this perturbed by small uh, rank model parameter and so forth. So that's the special um the theorem one that's specialized for this deep linear model is like this under some condition. So here, uh, what do you mean by how close, uh, what, how can you measure the approximation quality? The approximation quality is because these are all linear models. You can just look at the, the L2 difference between the model parameter, W bar and the product of this. So that's the, um, the approximation quality we are looking at. And we need to just solve the optimization problem where um, the optimization variables are, are these delta adapters, where each adapter's rank is bounded by R. So that's the optimization problem. And what we are showing is this is exactly equal to this. And the right hand side is, is a, to interpret this, if you look at this, I think I have something on this next slide. Okay, cool. So this, is actually nothing but just the discrepancy between 
the finer, um, the initial pre-trained model you have, and the finer target model. Finer target model's linear coefficient is this. This is my linear coefficient in the initial pre-trained model. So you can view that as error matrix, initial error matrix or initial discrepancy matrix. And the right hand side is RL plus first singular value of this matrix. And what that means is, in fact, there's some uh, rank aggregation is happening. The rank aggregation is happening by the way, what I mean is every layer has rank R model parameters. And the, the model is um, L has L layers. And there's some aggregation happening here because R times L is showing up. And if R is big and L is big, then you're choosing smaller and smaller singular value. If the R times L plus one is actually bigger than the rank of the, the error matrix, then you can see your error. So um, let's see. So let's see um, the first, in other words, the zero error is achievable if the rank is larger than the rank of the error matrix is divided by L. That's um, coming from the right-hand side. In fact, this is a generalization of the Young's theorem. Because if you just plug in W equals zero, L equals one, one that gives you, that it covers the Young's theorem. So, um, okay, so uh, okay, that's an interesting research. How do we prove it? I just give you um very high level proof idea and we'll move on to the second part. The proof idea is extremely simple. Um, I, if you consider the simplest case of the, the simplest model, so for simplicity, I further assume that I only care about the exact approximation. I want to find the condition for I can, under which I can find the exact um, approximation of the target model. Great. Exact approximation. Um, the exact approximation means this function can be exactly equal to this. So, so no approximation. No approximation. Yeah. Yeah. So basically that um, boils down to solving uh, uh, an equation, right? Because what I want to do is this is target matrix is linear coefficient. And I'm assuming that there are two layers for even more simplicity. And every layer has um, half the rank, half the uh, dimension rank. Now the, the coefficient of the fine-tuned network looks like this. And rank of each adapter is D half, where D is the size of the uh, matrix. So, um, so for proving this, um, the special version of the previous theorem, which is for exact approximation, you need to solve this optimize, uh, solve this solve this equation. Okay, so let me just reparameterize it. I'm gonna just um, decompose it into the product of these tall and short matrices by introducing this um, parameterization. Then you can move things around, and you can see that actually it's nothing but a uh, fourth order equations in matrices. So, so see that this is a constant, this is target matrix. This is also the uh, model parameters from the initial pre-trained model. And LR, those are the matrices I, I need to find. And this is fourth order term, or second order terms, and so forth. Some weird looking fourth order equation. Uh, are we uh, are we hopeful? Um, if you look at the equation, number of equations disappears here. That we did divide the matrices. So disappear um, equations. Number of variables you have is about order of two disk. So that probably means that if you carefully look at these equations and figure out how to solve it, you probably will be able to find uh, some solution to this equation. And in fact, this is the case for. This, so for this particular small um, example, this is the cross form solution to this equation. And you can actually extend this thing to more generic cases. Yeah, yeah. question. Which matrix? Which matrix? Um, I'm just giving you examples with uh, square matrices, but there's a um, general version of that. Cool. Um, there are more general results in the paper. Um, of course, we talk about nonlinear networks um, or so transformer networks and so forth. Um, only talked about the linear networks for simplicity, but take a look at the paper. Um, um, you might not be able to imagine how we could have handled nonlinearity based on the previous proof idea. There are multiple ways to handle nonlinearities. Uh, you can take a look at these papers, which we are also borrowed multiple proof techniques for that. Cool. Um, 
I'll give you a few more uh, practical implications of what our findings are and we'll move on to the second part. So LoRa is almost always better than the last layer fine tuning. Um, so in some sense, um, this is, imagine that you have a target network and target network um, has a different feature, feature extraction, feature extractor in the lower layers. And the pre-trained models are assumed that the pre-trained models have different feature networks. Then LoRa can actually adapt your feature network while last layer fine tuning cannot do that. So you can actually formalize this argument and prove it. Uh, I don't have time to go through it, but uh, it's a very good proof. So you can take a look at it. In fact, and that's actually what people are reporting in, um, in particular papers that last layer fine tuning versus LoRa with same number of model parameters, LoRa is almost always better in most practical cases. So I think we have some justification of what people are seeing. Another implication is our theory shows that R times L, which was the rank time step, is kind some kind of like um, surrogate for capturing the expressive power. We are only actually giving some lower but upper bound on, on the approximation error. So we cannot fully claim that, but still from the upper bound, we see R times L shows up, which is the rank aggregation we call. And you can actually see that in practice, um, even if you have much larger pre-trained model, if you use, um, Three times, let's say this is three times larger picture model in terms of depth. If you use three times larger rank with a smaller train, smaller picture model, you can actually match the performance when you down fine tune on the downstream task. So, kind of like R times L matters is actually observed in practice too. All right, sorry, less than 10 minutes. So, quickly move on to the second part, but there are a bunch of open questions. Um, as, and so, there are some more insights we provide in the paper. So if we take a look at it. Cool. Um, I will literally go through like some of the key ideas from the second paper. Any questions before we move on? Uh, so second paper is um, some work done with my student Ji Chen Lin called Dual Operating Modes of ICL. ICL is short for in context learning. So again, I'm gonna give you very few uh, motivations on why in context learning is important and useful. And we'll talk about the theory and um, theoretical exploration we have. Cool. What's in context learning? Um, you basically give some paired examples. You can say chicken boil, beer cerveza, and cheese. And the language model will eventually uh, automatically figure out how you want me to solve this English to Spanish translation. Well, um, this, can you guess the answer? One plus three is four. So plus five is seven. One fifty. Cool. Uh, what about this? Imagine a language model that can also see the image. So the sequence is like white and this image, this and this image, this and the image of the red car. So um, well, I mean, like uh, so this makes sense, but um, the language model just started seeing images and just started throwing images. So there's no benchmark out there yet. So this is the new benchmark we just posted earlier this week. Think about the same thing for this task. But um, in-context learning is basically, as I mentioned, it's one particular prompt engineering technique where you implicitly signal what you want to do, what you want the model to do as a form of labeled sentence, x1, fx1, x2, fx2, and you give xk plus one, you hope the language model figure out what you want to do, and you apply the, the language model applies F returns FXK plus one. Okay. Does it actually work? Yes, GPT-4. Um, I showed that this learning is working. Um, you just give this like V as a like mysterious symbol, and you actually figure out this is X1 plus X2 plus five. The second example is more difficult. It's like um, V was used to denote 10x1 plus 2x2. It figures out the rules and gives the right answer. Yes, um, but um, the model just figures out, uh, I didn't specify that you have to solve the linear systems. 
But then there's a one interesting phenomenon that people have observed. Why? Uh, what is that? Is so in the previous setting, uh, and in the, the previous the standard understanding of in-context learning is you give labeled example as part of the prompt. The model learns the function, not applies. But then there was a new paper, um, not new paper, so three years old paper by Minadal. They show something um, very unintuitive, which is, well, in context learning actually doesn't see the labels. So if you look at the accuracy, the yellow curve, yellow bars are demonstration with two labels. The red bars are, the pink bars are demonstration with random labels. What they are showing is in many cases, there's not, not much even differences. Sometimes there's some little bit of drop, but even the drop is too small. And our previous understanding of in-context learning completely breaks down here. So what is happening here? So just go back to this previous example. Our standard understanding of in-context learning was like, oh, you're seeing this X and FX pairs. You learn F on the fly. That's what you learn how to do from pre-training. But in fact, um, this um, allowed, made people to think about a completely different way of seeing what in-context learning is doing, which is task retriever. So basically what task retriever means is they already know how to solve this task. All you're doing is at test time, you have like so many tools in your bucket and you just figure out which tool to pull out, which hammer to come up and come out, um, pull out from your pocket and use it. So that's, that viewpoint is called task retriever. Okay. And in fact, this is uh, one really interesting example. Like I just uh, tested in the morning. So I give this, what is the color of apple? And this is the translation of this Korean sentence, which is what is also what is the color of an apple. Hello, and I put annyeonghaseyo is the Korean uh, sentence for hello. Now, what is the color of banana? So, so everyone, um, assuming that you guys um, know Korean, and know that this is in context function I'm um, implying is English to Korean translation, correct? Can anyone guess what the GPT will say? This is a GPT-4, today's GPT-4. It starts answering the, uh, it answers the question. Okay. So what is happening here? So um, this is exactly, um, so this is the most important uh, phenomena that we want to, um, emphasize in this talk. It, the, the examples you see, the model sees in the examples is translation, but it just takes um, things that, oh, there's a Korean sentence, English sentence, Korean sentence, English sentence, Korean sentence. So it is confused and it starts thinking this is a translation task, or oh, sorry, uh, it, so, okay, my bad. That's the, that's the thing that they have to figure out. Sorry, my bad. But the last sentence is in a question. So it gets confused and starts thinking of, maybe I should answer this question. And the model answers this question. You know, and then after that, it also starts translating. It's kind of a stupid thing. So the retrieve function is question answer somehow. Can there be like an even basic problem with this? Because I think they have problem with negation, right? So you saw this example, so they like, show me a picture without any pyramid. Mm -hmm. And you show you exactly a picture with pyramid. Uh -huh. And say, this is a picture with no pyramid, but there is a pyramid. So I think it might be that it just doesn't know the con, like, it picks up pyramid, mm -hmm. but even the context of language is mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. So maybe problem is even not only doesn't do learning of the context, but I don't know. Okay. It's just like so, a more basic problem. I don't know. It's I hold it only one minute. So, yeah. so I can only give you the, the highlight of what we want to say. Okay. Is basically, we want to come up with, so this is a bunch of good work on ICL. i skip it. Um, but under certain models, we can actually somehow formalize what's happening in the previous slide. 
That's why we want to talk about. So there's a basically it's, the setting is meta learning uh, linear regression, meta learned linear regression. Um, so I skipped the details. Um, okay, those are the details. Um, okay, so with the linear regression setting, what you can show is there's some implicit Bayesian inference happening with the meta learning setting. And what you can show is, um, of course, this is now it's all about post computing the posterior. And assuming the Gaussian mixture setting, the posterior has two components, which is the, the weight for each component and also the mean of each component. So once you see the um, evidence, you update the posterior. And the, the posterior is going to move these things around and also change the weight of it. And of course, clearly you can see that depending on the, um, the, the ratio of the variances or the, the absolute values of magnitudes of these variances, which of these two things happen first change. Sometimes the component reweighting happened first. Sometimes component shifting happened first. So that's the, actually the key things that you can study just purely from the posterior uh, analysis with the linear regression with Gaussian mixture setting. And what that basically um, helps out understand is one last slide, which is only a phenomenon. So I guess this is a very um, less known phenomena in the literature. Some people just think this is just a like, typo or maybe just like, some experimental error. But there's a clear evidence that one shot for uh, few shot examples, few shot learning is worse than zero shot. But if you keep giving more and more examples, then eventually catches up. So this, this is the table from GPT-3 paper. And if you see that the accuracy, the zero shot is 76%, one shot is actually worse. And then eventually few shots with five or 10 shots, you get better. Perplexity is the, and the lower the better, three is zero shot goes up and goes down. And similar thing is happening with this thing too, um, goes down and comes up. In fact, you can actually reproduce the same setting with the synthetic data such as well. This is shared. Uh, um, they use this um, mixture Markov chain model to repro uh, reproduce this research as well. You see that this x axis is the number of examples you have in context. Y axis is the accuracy of the fusion learning goes down and comes up. So we just call it um, from the risk view, um, we call it early ascent because in the earlier phase, it goes up and goes down the um, hill later. In short, um, in short, you can actually um, fully explain it from the posterior analysis. And the idea is that task retriever is happening first in certain cases. And task retriever could be misled if your input distribution is not consistent with what you see during pre-training. So that's a short um, summary of what's happening in the early ascent phenomenon. And after that, the task learning will start kicking in and you can fix the problem. And this is the coolest visualization where um, you start from no examples. And this is actually the true model parameter you have to find. And this is the wrong model parameter. As you increase number of parameters, it actually is misled, it got confused and goes, is dragged to the, the wrong center and eventually comes back. So this is showing that uh, why in the earlier phase of in-context learning, the risk is actually going up because you're you are finding a wrong prior and stick to that. But then later on, as you have more and more samples, you go and find, find the right center. So then you can recover the perfect accuracy eventually. So that's what um, uh, we think the earlier ascent is happening. There are multiple like risk copper bounds and there's severe analyzed zero shot ICL with even real world experiment with 70 billion model parameters. With that, um, I'm, um, thank you so much for um, listening to my talk. Uh, we didn't um, talk about all the other collaborators, um, thanks to the collaborators, but yeah, that's the um, work I have been working on. So happy to answer any questions. Different, 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 different
So, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you can have it that way. Uh, see what is the optimal uh, rank uh, of some players. Yeah, yeah. So, the question is um, so the analysis we have is exactly covered for any rank computation. But that doesn't mean that uh, you can use our upper bound to find the optimal rank computation because it's just an upper bound. So minimizing the upper bound, I don't think that reduces the good rank computation. Um, and also in our uh, upper bound, um, I didn't show the general form, but when the Rs are different, it just sums up the rank. So that doesn't give you the, uh, the good um, um, bounds. There are some nonlinear cases where the, the ranks are added, but with different weights. Um, but I don't think that's actually like fundamental weights, but it's more like an artificial um, rate coming from the analysis. So the short answer is, I don't know. There's a VC dimension analysis for low rank model training, not for fine training, but um, the setting is slightly different, which is you train from scratch. So you only analyze just, you, you need to, and then they analyze the VC dimension of this low rank neural networks. And from the VC dimension analysis, you see um, a different way. So the, the lower layers have more impact than the, the higher layers, which kind of makes sense in terms of VC dimensions. Um, but I don't know whether the VC dimension analysis or the field. There's no concrete answers yet. There are many practical um, heuristic approaches that people are using. They have very weird way of allocating max. So explaining the rank location with more theory is something that we have right here. Are there questions online? Uh, if not, then let's thank Kamuk. I think they're going over time quite a bit. Uh, sorry for the initial technical difficulties that we had. Thanks a lot, Kamuk. Thank you.